Hi, Bowen. Subhasandhyao. Good evening. To stress the importance in throttling the purgative state of the Sri Lankan economy is evident today more than any time in the history of the country. It is the single most reason for the country to fall into this dilemma we are in today. If nothing been done to arrest this slide, the country may drag to a social chaos that seems inevitable. Sri Lanka is a poor country in comparison to most countries in the eyes of the world. However, it should be borne in mind, especially by the Sri Lankans, that Sri Lanka is not the poor country that has been envisaged and measured by the scale from a Westerner's yardstick. Sri Lanka's resources are rich. Its heritage, a magnificent opulence, its culture a splendor, the beacon of Buddhism, that can boast to have an abundance of riches with magnificent ancient structures that speaks loud with engineering marvels, rich in morals, principles and ethics that are more than any other populace that I have come to know and researched. The only deterrent to this recognition is the economic front that has affected due to alienating the values that are dear to them, to Sri Lankans. Sri Lanka is known to the world as a paradise. Let me ask sarcastically, in semantics, why is it then those who are in paradise aspire to leave Sri Lanka if paradise is the place they aspire to be and pray hoping for such a futuristic event in their daily rituals? Is it because they believe that these foreign countries they desire to live provide a haven for work, to earn a decent wage and live a better life with parity, which Sri Lankans don't have? which Sri Lankans is aloof? There is an argument that by providing labor in rich countries generates funds to support families back home and also will help the economy of the country. In some estimates, these revenues are rated as the second most viable economy or viable income to the Sri Lanka's economy. This may be true, but it does not help the development of the wealth of the Sri Lanka at its roots. The economy of the country should grow not by individual gains, but by utilizing the national resources that will sustain development and benefit the country. Depreciation of the Sri Lankan rupee against major currencies could be attributed to the dependence of the Sri Lanka for foreign goods and due to the slow growth in the economy. A united national effort with the collaboration of government and 
private sectors should be worked out, tested to create opportunities in various fields in the labor force with the aim of creating jobs in every conceivable sector. The brain drain should be stopped by incentives at the workplace. Love to work in the country you owe and to serve must be a, a patriotic feeling that comes within the pulse of the country, encouraged by the values that you inherited, by a supreme teaching that shaped your heritage and carved your culture. Irrespective of what religion you belong to, it is the most important feature of our lives to create a unified pulse of the people. Therefore, take heed to build this nation, working together with your own self effort for the sake of our future generation. Do not look beyond your household values. Do not blame the country for what it is now that you are experiencing. You are in the amid of this mishmash. Focus on your family and do not let it divide by party politics, divide by affiliations, divide by race and ethnicity, religion, or divide by conflicting values. Focus on the unity and the prosperity of your family. Do not leave your loved ones behind, hoping to make riches in a foreign country. Bestow, give your energy to the country you owe. Think how to fix the menacing enigmas, the problems of the country. Today, most Sri Lankans are tuned to values that are alien to them. They have been brainwashed with values that do not belong to their heritage and to their cultural fabric. Yet, clutches them as superior fads of higher esteem. This must be the first step that we as Sri Lankans must learn to give up and enhance values of our own. Be proud to be a Sri Lankan. Without this love to your country, there is no revival, no renaissance. It should encompass our heritage, our culture, products, and even our food that we eat, that we consume. In order to stifle and enhance the sliding economy, Sri Lanka needs to take a deep breath of fresh air, meaning an invigorating plan of action to stop the bleeding of this unfortunate situation. Affecting the people, the people of Sri Lanka, or else the denigration and the depreciation of their country's economic standing in the world will decline, erade to an irreversible state. The philosophical way of life in terms of economic prosperity is to earn more than what you can spend, or to say in other words, to earn about the cost of living. 
applying this formula to the whole country, the measure is called the GDP index, a broad measure of overall domestic production equal to the total expenditures for all final goods and services produced within the country. Giving a comprehensive scorecard of the economic health of the country. Sri Lanka's gross domestic product in 2021 has been downgraded to 4.0 percent by the IMF, the International Monetary Fund, from a 5.3 percent forecasted in October 2020, whereas the global growth upgraded to 6.5 percent. India, with 12.5 percent, the highest, and Bhutan, Pakistan, Myanmar and Nepal with the lowest projections for 2021 in Asia. These are based on research by Gert Hofstede with a score of 80 on the power distant index for Sri Lanka has shown a relatively divided hierarchical society. A hierarchy reflects inherent inequalities, centralization of power as an authoritative state. The study shows that Sri Lanka needs to unite clearing all divisions between beliefs, rich and poor, and among ethnicities. A difficult task. Coherent spiritual development coupled with a viable plan of action to boost the economy, it is the answer. Rather than expressing financial in financial terms let me make it in simple words for everyone to understand what needs to be done take for instance tourism tourism is the major source of income to sri lanka needless to say that the sri lanka is the world's envy to being one of the finest tourist destinations. Therefore, developing and maintaining the operational and supporting structures, its components, and by improving upon the existing, by enhancing this industry, is of paramount importance. Lodgings in remote archaeological historical sites, which attracts visitors, should be developed. Not by current trends to create concrete jungles or clearing the forest by distasteful decisions, which has effectively harmed the heritage and the scenic beauty of the country, of Sri Lanka. Tourists coming, entering the country for more than 10 days, be given a free one-day tour to any heritage site, such as Anuradhapura, Polonnaruwa, Sigiriya, Damulla, Jaffna, Gaul, Kandy, with an authentic free Sri Lankan meal provided at the government's expense. Promote tourism with a qualified educator or by recorded audio guides, giving a historical and archaeological insight of its significance. This will increase the appreciation of our engineering marvels, 
that is a hallmark in our crowning heritage of Sri Lanka. The second most important thing is productivity. And it is a broad subject. This takes us to the first and the foremost commodity that needs our attention, agriculture. Developing a state-of-the-art large-scale farms that are economically feasible and sensible must be considered. In every plantation, produce and in rice fields. Young blood needs to be encouraged to gain a training to seek an education at university level in agriculture. Major universities such as the University of Calpoli Pomona in the USA, which awards degrees in agriculture should be consulted if necessary, to collaborate and be part of a student exchange program and research. The, co the goal should be to increase productivity using a bio-friendly organic fertilizers without harming the environment. Harmful chemicals and insecticides in conditioning the soil should be eliminated ecological must be, must to preserve our well-being. The third important vector toward this revival effort should be in reducing imports and dependence on foreign goods that are unnecessary. The love and respect to Sri Lankan products must be developed and firmly sealed within the psyche of the nation. Or else, it's like having a hole in the bucket that will drain the country's economy while boosting the egotistical pride of the rich over the have-nots that can afford foreign goods. Import of all luxury cars should be banned. High registration fees shall be or should be imposed on these vehicles. In the agricultural front, we should cultivate needed produce that we are used to and reduce the addiction The greed for palatable foreign products, produce that we have. To quote an example, eight to ten years ago, America used to import lentils, paripu, from India and from the Middle East. Today, it is a major supplier. The principal growing regions are northern plains of Montana, North Dakota, South Dakota, and Eastern Washington. Same can be said about rice, dates, and energy. A revolution in the supply and demand frontier in American agriculture. Once the rice bowl of Asia, with impressive irrigation marvels, like the Yodala and the tanks that stored water for the country's cultivations, Sri Lanka has thousands of years of experience in agriculture. What has gotten in the way of Sri Lanka to be the glory that was before? I don't have no answer. 
increase the skilled labor in this field. Trade schools must be geared to train an effective labor force. Depending on the areas that are mostly helpful, especially to drive the economy. Case in point, the requirement of licensed electricians, inspectors, code enforcing agents, testing laboratories, quality control labs, material testing labs, which I find few in Sri Lanka compared with other developing countries. Dignity of labor, equality, and earning power should be addressed, which are needed to sustain and enhance the quality of life without disparity. Engineers should be trained on specific areas, such as in the design and construction of high-rise buildings, earthquake safety, and other complex structures that needs a great, greater exposure in the classroom and in the field. Development of a skilled labor force comprising in construction, computers, health, law enforcing, firefighting, emergency, farming, should be encouraged among the youth as dignifying jobs, earning a well-deserved income. Increase a networking environment is the next most important vector to help the economy. With the advent of the internet, transfer and storage of information has become a routine. The manpower required to this once laborious task is now being brought to the palm of the individual and to the desktop of every household. There should be an indispensable effort to have every man, woman, and child be acquainted with the technology irrespective of their financial standing. Incentives to enhance this corridor should be investigated at all levels and categories of education. Computers must be built, assembled in Sri Lanka. There are many Sri Lankans who does build custom computers here in the USA. Hella or native medicine should be brought to the limelight, to the forefront with more research documentation organized in an institutionalized manner, and working with doctors trained in Western medicine. One justice for all should be the motto. Strict laws, regardless of social standing or cost, must be enforced. Violators of public funds and damage to heritage sites, parks, and wildlife, and the imputable harm to the wealth of the economy should be protected. Anyone violating this national wealth should be dealt severely to the extent of the law. Performing arts in the music and film industry should create an impact to the economy and the film industry. The beautiful landscape of the country 
should be an attraction to foreign film producers, a source of foreign revenue that needs to be explored. Also, capturing the talents of Sri Lankans and bringing forth to international audience should be explored. The most important thing is elect exemplary leaders who live by example, perform with no bias, and are intellectually and morally sound and wise. Exhibit no disgraceful acts that will tarnish the image of the nation by being corrupt and by being at each other's throat. Negativ negativity of things should be turned to a positive outlook and increase performance at all levels in each and every sector. Sri Lankans should ease on the consumption of alcohol. Anyone promoting drugs to the youth in public places should be dealt severely to the maximum extent of the law. Sri Lanka today has become the hub to drug dealers, traders. Transportation. Transportation and strict traffic laws should be enforced. Safety should be the priority. Free transportation to seniors over 70 years in public transportation must be provided at specific times from designated places to church, to temples, and other places such as wherever they would like to be. Promote cultural and heritage irrespective of race, religion, and ethnicity. Example of this vector in enhancing the economy is China, India, Pakistan, Israel, and Israel, which promotes culture and heritage with one voice. It is a depreciating and a wasteful effort to realize that the Sri Lankans have shunned away from realizing this epitome of our unique culture and heritage that we possess. If we want the country to prosper as the saying goes, we should not take the eye off the ball. We should be focused on this element of fact. It is important to safeguard our cultural values and our heritage from a latent force working its way to subjugate this unique place in the world we Sri Lankans have. Over any other country, preserved for over 3,000 years. Christians, Hindus, Muslims, should take this fact to heed without thinking that it is an attempt to hinder and subdue their beliefs. But be a player in de defeating these elements with the motive to trump and to win the country towards a social renaissance by creating an economic opulence to every citizen. Not to divide and claim rights that does not make sense in a country with a history that is far in years to reach, even beyond the times of Ravana or Mahabharata. A perfect example of this is China. China's population today is 1.4 billion 
out of which only 250 million are Buddhist. That is 18.2 percent. The, the seventh century Buddhist artifacts are being dug out in many places. And from paddy fields, as archaeological digging continues even today, as I speak. Now, when these artifacts are found, they are brought to the attention of the authorities. And high priority is given to safeguard the surrounding environment. The whole idea is to lay the foundation to boost the attendance by way of tourism. To these newly discovered sites, that was once Buddhism in ancient China, a heritage that all Chinese are proud of, all of which is done mainly by non-Buddhists. Chinese. Same can be said of India. The population of Buddhists in India is about 10 million, compared to a population of 1.25 billion people. That is only 0.8 percent of the population. India has some of the most important Buddhist sites that attracts visitors from every corner of the world. Even today, they unearth sites that were the emblem, the symbol of Buddhist culture. In my estimates, the increase in tourism to Buddhist sites in India compared to 10 years ago is nearly 60%. There is a revival in the interest in studying the relevance of Buddhism in India to know about the Indo-Christianity that drew the world closer to the Indian influence during the 6th century BC to the 4th century AD. From philosophers such as Pythagoras, Socrates, Plato, Oregon, and the father of the New Testament, Bishop Isobius, and even Jesus. IAS, the Indian Archaeological Survey of India, has identified sites and named them with Buddhist names to draw pilgrims, tourists, in order to increase revenues. The tourist comes in millions each year to visit Piparava, Budagaya, Shanti, Sravasti, Sarnath, Nalanda, and to mention Dharmasala, where His Holiness Dalai Lama makes his temple, the sanctuary, contributing an insurmountable source in revenue to the Indian economy all in the hands of Hindu governors and power. The politicians, the people who are mostly Hindus and Muslims, work hand in hand with one thing in mind, to attract tourists, the pilgrims, at the expense of Buddhist heritage, Buddhist sites. I have spent long time enough visiting these places and I know the intricacies, how, the, how they operate, sorry, how they operate and function in boosting the economy in their constituents. One Muslim friend working at an archaeological site said, when I asked him, when do you get the time to pray. He replied, he looked at me and he replied, I only must pray when I don't have enough. Thank to Buddha.
Same can be said of Pakistan. A population of 173 million with 0.1% Buddhist. Though most sites are protected by the UNESCO, the Pakistan government and the people have adopted a policy to safeguard and protect these Buddhist sites. Once the Gandhara civilization, which had the largest number of Buddha statues that were de decapitated and destroyed by the Islamic religious fanatics and terrorists, now being protected and policed by Muslims. The people in these areas speak well and highly about Buddhism and its heritage. Visitors pay more attention to these Muslim villages, these, these village people, than to the guides who gives a much, these village people give a much more elaborate description about the history and its relation to Buddhism. The environment is serene and peaceful bringing large sums of money to Pakistan, injecting the economy by tourism, and showcasing the world its Buddhist, Buddhist, excuse me, its Buddhist heritage. Museums in Lahore, Taxila, Swat Valley, Peshawar, are treasure houses filled with Buddhist artifacts. That was once the epitome of Buddhism. During the Parthian Kingdom, beginning from Kanishka in the first century, if you visit Pakistan, you will see a host of Buddhist artifacts in museums. Just last week, some Buddhist monks were invited by the High Commission to a week-long pilgrimage to visit Buddhist heritage sites by the Commission of Pakistan, I believe, in from Sri Lanka. The Prime Minister, Mr. Khan, Imran Khan, addressing the delegation, promised to develop the Buddhist circuit in Pakistan. Great news for the love towards boosting the economy of Pakistan at the expense of Buddhist heritage. Israel is another country that promotes Christianity or prom promotes Christian archaeological sites, which has only 2% of Christians that are mostly in Jerusalem. If you visit Israel, you will find archaeologists and Jewish labor working, in, working hand in hand, working in archaeological sites and naming the finds with biblical names relating to as Christian heritage. Jews have distance from the New Testament as a different opine on Christianity. However, one thing is evident, that in the heart of the Jews lies not the division of beliefs, but the economic benefit that brings by the Christian tourists to Israel especially from America, England, Europe, and even some from India. This is only a rough outline to stimulate the falling economy of Sri Lanka or the failing economy of Sri Lanka. It should be, remo it should be noted that there are highly qualified Sri Lankan economists who may have different views and will suggest pragmatic economic stimulus strategies. And I'm sure that they will. Whatever they may be, it is time we as Sri Lankans to work together in developing the societal economies rather than looking into stepping and competing with local economies. 
as none will want Sri Lanka to succeed, but to drag the country to the bottom and eradicate its Buddhist heritage and the culture that is unique and the envy of the world. Why am I linking the archaeological, historical and social and religious factors as an approach to economic revival is not just to hypothesize possible remedies but to suggest a pragmatic approach towards the economy, uh, towards the economic recovery of Sri Lanka. Thank you very much. I won't.